ladies and gentlemen. Um, we well, have the same rules for the speakers. Um, 14 minutes talk, and there will be a ring five minutes before the end of the presentation. At the end of each talk, there will be 10 minute discussion time. Now we will have Dr. Weissman to be the chairman in morning for a section two translational research in regenerative medicine. Please, back to you. Thank you, Sophie. Um, I'm, uh, I would like to thank Peter for ha having worked so hard to, to make us comfortable and feel welcome here at Tsuchi. I also want to thank Wendy, who is uh, has worked on the other end to help organize this meeting and I'm so happy that her name is Wendy and his name is Peter because if you remember the Peter Pan story as a Wendy. <laughs> I'm now looking for a Tinkerbell. <laughs> um, it's my great pleasure and I can um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to talk very fast in the next 40 minutes um, much faster than I normally talk, and you will hear my, my voice go from Tsuji time to New York time. <laughs> it will also go twice as fast, because I added several slides for Chris, my friend. Normally I would not put uh, all these slides in, but I wanted to explain the spinal cord injury itself, and the model, and what the spinal cord injury looks like, so, so that um, you have a way of visualizing in the spinal cord, what we're trying to achieve. Um, in spinal cord injury, 90% of the people who have been injured <clears throat> were injured because of something pressing on the spinal cord very rapidly. This is called a contusion. A contusion is like somebody punching you in the face. And um, it is very rapid compression of the tissue. Now, if you take the spinal cord and you stretch it slowly, it can tolerate a lot of stretching, like a rubber band. You can stretch the spinal cord to nearly twice its length and will not be harmed. In the same way, I can bend over like this, and that's stretching my spinal cord, and it's not harming it, as long as I do it slowly. But if you do it fast, if you do it faster than 0 0.5 meters per second, that is when the axons or the nerve fibers begin to break. <clears throat> now, the spinal cord is like a <clears throat> tube of toothpaste. The outside of the tube of toothpaste is, is a very tough skin called dura. By the way, dura in Latin means tough mother. And therefore, it, whenever you want to say something to your mother, you can say dura. <laughs> <laughs> When she that makes you do something you don't want to do. And in the, because the dura is very, very tough, when you press on it, there's only two ways that the tissue can move. It can move longitudinally, up or down. And be, when it moves up or down, it pulls on the tissue. And in 1985, <clears throat> Andrew Blight, in my laboratory at NYU, found something very startling about spinal cord injury. He found that when the spinal cord is contused, at rates of 0.5 meters per second, all the large myelinated axons break. And this was really quite a surprise, because if you look at an, a nerve fiber and it's myelinated, the myelin seems like it's armor and it's preventing the axon from stretching. Why are the large myelinated axons so sensitive to being contused? Well, it is of course because of the nodes of Ranvier. The myelin segments cover um, most of the spinal cord, except for these areas that, that are called the nodes of Ranvier. And because the rest of it is myelinated, when the axon is being stretched, those nodes are the only places that stretch, and that's it, where all the movement is, and that's why the nodes of Ranvier break. And that's why large myelinated axons are the first to go in terms of the spinal cord injury. Now, when you compress on the spinal cord, what happens is that you're increasing the pressure within the tissue. What happens when you increase the pressure? 
When you increase the pressure so that the pressure in the tissue equals your blood pressure, then of course blood stops flowing. So compression is essentially ischemia or loss of blood flow to the spinal cord. Now many people with spinal cord injury not only have a contusion, but there's continuing bone resting on the spinal cord, pressing on it, that's causing compression, increasing the pressure in the spinal cord, and that slows down blood flow. But even more important, the spinal cord begins to swell after an injury. When that swelling occurs, it increases the pressure, and it also causes loss of blood flow. So spinal cord injury is a combination of contusion and ischemia, loss of blood flow to the spinal cord. So a normal rat spinal cord looks like this. This is a very special section of the uh, histological preparation of the spinal cord. The spinal cord was cut with a bone and we had to decalcify it. And what you see in the middle of this um, is a, um, this is the spinal cord and, and this is stained with a, a stain that I always thought of as the Irish stain. It's, it's actually called Mallory trichrome. I don't know whether the histologist is an Irish man or not, but uh, this trichrome stain stains all uh, cytoplasm. Of course, this is the insides of cells. The cytoplasm is red. All collagen is blue, and then all nuclei would be brown. And wherever there are lots of cells, you can see that it's sort of brown. So this is what a normal spinal cord looks like. These are the segments. These are the discs. Uh, this is the place where um, the, the back of the spinal cord, and this is where the operations are usually done to expose the spinal cord. So here is the spinal cord where we have removed the lamina, this is the dorsal part of the spinal cord, uh, the bone covering the spinal cord. And this is what happens when we drop a weight, 10 gram weight, onto the spinal cord. And we wait two weeks, and this is what it looks like. Now, if you remember, this was completely red before. Now you can see the big hole where the injury is, and you can see a lot of the loss of cells in the surrounding area. This is a 12.5 millimeter weight drop. This is a weight that was dropped only 12.5 millimeters, 10 grams dropped 12.5 millimeters onto the spinal cord. And this is the damage that occurs. By the way, 90% of all rats walk with this kind of lesion. You only need 10% of your spinal cord to walk. The spinal cord is tremendously redundant, and you don't need to regenerate, restore more than 10% of the spinal cord to get very substantial function back. In fact, a rat with 10% of its spinal cord will look so normal that you cannot see the difference. You cannot tell that the animal has been injured. By the way, that is my definition of a cure. My definition of a cure is that if you can look at a person you, and you cannot tell that that person has ever been spinal injured, that is my cure. Doesn't mean the person's normal. Doesn't mean that we've restored that person to a marathon runner. But if somebody, a third party, pretty smart person looking at you can say, oh, I didn't know he was injured, that's a cure to me. And that's the goal of our clinical trials. This is what happens when you drop the same weight 25 millimeters onto the spinal cord. 90% of these animals do not walk, and you can see that there are almost no axons that remain. This is what the spinal cord looks like at um, 14 weeks after spinal cord injury. By the way, these are very rare pictures. You don't see many laboratories showing you 14-week-old pictures of the spinal cord because it takes a lot of work to keep an animal with spinal cord injury going for such a long time. You have to squeeze its bladder every day. Can you imagine taking a rat and squeezing the bladder of this rat? Because it can't pee just like people, but you, they're too small to put a catheter in. And so one of the things that you will notice about here is that there are two big openings here. Well, rats develop something called syringomyelic cysts, just like humans do. And, in fact, if you look very carefully, you can see there's a pendimal layer of cells, and, in fact, there are two syringomyelic cysts here. But contrary to what all other people seem to talk about when they show pictures of the spinal cord, they show a spinal cord with a big hole in the middle, with a cavitation site. In a study that we published in 1997, 
by the multi-center animal spinal cord injury study, we examined 700 spinal cords that had been contused. And uh, nearly 75%, three quarters of the spinal cords that were contused did not have a hole in the middle. Instead, what it had was a loose matrix of tissue. And this loose matrix of tissue is filled with nestin positive, probably stem cells. Um, the reason why they don't see it is because all these investigators, they use frozen sections of the spinal cord and this loose matrix of tissue always falls out and it looks like a hole. It's an artifact. Very seldom do you get a, a hole of this sort. If you do see a hole, it should be one in which there's an ependymal layer surrounding it. If you don't see an ependymal layer surrounding it, it is very likely that the cavitation that you've seen is an artifact of the way you've cut the section. Now, here I've enlarged this part of the picture so that you can see there are bridges here. By the way, this is a GFAP stain. And so you can see GFAP is upregulated up and down the whole spinal cord. By the way, these yellow things that you see are uh, autofluorescent macrophages. And this is something that Yi should like. She's a macrophage expert, but you can see they're always there, many thousands of them. But there are all these astrocytic bridges, and although this picture doesn't show, if you do a silver stain or a neurofilament stain, you see that there are axons running into this bridge. There are many, many axons inside the matrix. In fact, axons are growing into this loose tissue matrix. We don't know whether they're leaving it, but we know that they're entering it. Um, very interestingly, uh, we have a picture here. Um, this is a picture of the central canal, this section fortuitously cut right through the central canal. And you look at the central canal, you say, oh, it looks hairy. This is very interesting. Why does it look hairy? Well, it looks hairy because the central canal, ependymal layer, is normally has end feet, astrocytic end feet that's abutting against it because the end feet of astrocytes form the blood-brain barrier. And we know that the ependymal layer of the central canal doubles or triples, you know, it proliferates because of uh, cytokines or whatever that's released after injury. And the, the, the cells have proliferated and these are the end feet of the astrocytes poking against the original endo, uh, um, ependymal cell layer. And then finally, this section crossed right here through an area of the central uh, of the cortical spinal tract. And in the rat, the cortical spinal tract runs right up above the central canal in the dorsal column. And it's very interesting. If you look at it closely, it is filled with macrophages. This um, cortical spinal tract is still degenerating after, at 14 weeks after spinal cord injury, uh, contusion injury in the rat. So bearing the, this picture of spinal cord injury in mind, I want to now talk about how would you regenerate such a spinal cord? Because I believe that this is the spinal cord that is present in probably 60, 70, 80% of people with spinal cord injury. So <clears throat> when you regenerate the spinal cord, we want to achieve several things. The first is the injury site itself. The spinal cord injury site is an area of dead tissue surrounded by glia and molecules that stop axonal growth. And there's this loose matrix of tissue that's present. Axons get into there, and I believe that the axons don't have any cues as to where to grow. There are not signs saying, oh, grow north, oh, grow south. There are, the axons go in there, and they sometimes can get lost. So one of the ways in which you can get around this problem is to bridge the gap. And that is to put a bridge of living cells across the injury site that would support axonal growth. Second, you would like to have sustained axonal growth. Um, most people don't realize this, but axons grow very slowly, no faster than your hair can grow. I don't see many women here with long hair, but if you grow your hair from your head down to here, uh, I think all of you recognize this will not take several months. This will take years. But the problem is, at, right after injury, there's an increase in growth factors, and then the growth factors go away after several weeks, and there is no sustained growth factor support for continued regeneration for years, months. And so, it is really important to have growth factor support to allow axons growing at less than one millimeter a day to reach their targets. 
Now the third is, is an um, obstacle, is something that was identified by, firstly by Martin Schwab and then um, by a number of other um, researchers in the 1990s. Nogo was the first of the inhibitors and then chondroitin 6 sulfate proteoglycans were shown to prevent axonal growth. And very fortunately, um, specific drugs have now been developed to block both NOGO and CSPG. And these are called growth inhibitors, and one should have drugs to help block the growth inhibitors so we can get the axons all the way back to their origins. So this is schematically what it looks like and what we're trying to achieve with our therapies of spinal cord injury in our clinical trials. We have the spinal cord. This is the injury site. We inject the cells into the surrounding spinal cord. By the way, these are depictions of axons trying to grow across. These are terminal end bulbs. Uh, Jerry Silver has described these end bulbs as frustrated growth cones. Um, Dick Bungie, my, my friend Dick Bungie, who used to head the Miami Project, showed me a picture of a 20-year-old human spinal cord where there are thousands and thousands of these terminal bulbs lining up at the edge of the injury site almost like racers, ready to go. And this is 20 years after injury. I don't believe that you can have terminal end bulbs that last for 20 years. I think these terminal end bulbs are being made every day as the axons get close to the injury site, then the end bulb sees all this chondroitin 6 sulfate proteoglycans and say, oh, we can't go through there, so they back up. And then they try again. All through the lifetime of the patient, these axons are trying and trying and trying and trying to get across the injury site. And what we want to do is to build that bridge. If you inject the cells into the surrounding spinal cord, they will migrate into the injury site and they form a bridge that would allow the axons to go across. And you would like to get it to grow, to keep growing, and also to block the growth inhibitors in the surrounding spinal cord. Now, um, a student of mine, Kai Liu, um, started working with me about maybe 10 years ago. And he was very interested in a cell that's called olfactory and sheathing glial cells. These cells are born in your nose and they migrate in the olfactory nerve to the olfactory bulb. They escort growing axons to their destinations. The olfactory nerve is the only nerve in your body, in the body of all mammals, that continually regenerates after throughout adult life. Olfactory and sheathing glial cells not only facilitate axonal regeneration, but they also remyelinate axons in the spinal cord. And I, I want to briefly show you some data to convince you that this is true. So the olfactory bulb, if you recall, um, uh, is, is, the olfactory bulb is situated at the base of the brain. There's a uh, place in the base of the brain, in the base of the skull, that's called um, the cribriform plate. And the nerves go through the holes in the bone. And the nerves come from the nasal mucosa, and um, the olfactory neurons send axons that go and, and make synapses with the olfactory glomerulus. There are stem cells in the olfactory bulb and uh, the olfactory nasal mucosa that travel with the growing axons and escort the axons all the way to the injury site. I mean, to the olfactory bulb. So these are sections of the of the. Um, olfactory bulb in the rat, and uh, this is stained for P75, which is a, the NGF receptor. The um, uh, olfactory and sheathing glial cells just overexpress P75, so that you can see they're very brightly shining there. If you take these P75 cells, isolate them, you can see that they're in culture, they're really quite beautiful looking. They are also express L1, the cellular adhesion molecule. They express nestin, they express laminin. This is a combination of, of these pictures here. Um, and of course, what we did was we took uh, olfactory and sheathing glial cells from rats that are constitutively expressing green fluorescent protein. These are mice that are rats that glow in the dark <laughs> when we shine ultraviolet light on them. Anyway, all the cells are green, so we know what we have transplanted. And the pictures that you will see are GFP rat, uh, cells that have been transplanted. Um, and they're, of course, all GP75 uh, positive. 
So when we inject these cells into the spinal cord, we can take the whole spinal cord and we can look at the spinal cord and we can see the green cells in the spinal cord. And these are whole mount spinal cord, unstained, and we're looking through a dissecting microscope that has an epifluorescent attachment. We found out very early, and this is true of all cells that we have tried, that if we give a bolus dose of methylprednisolone, 30 milligrams per kilogram bolus IV into the animal, we get marked improvement in the cell numbers that survive. This has, not been, uh, this has been reported not only by my lab, but also by in, at the Miami Project by Mary Bungie. There are more than 10 times cell survival at the injury site. So, so this is methylprednisolone, as you may recall, is a drug that I was very involved for nearly half of my career as a treatment for acute spinal cord injury. It turns out it is remarkably effective for helping survival of transplanted cells. This is what it looks like at two weeks after injury. This is controlled, this methylprednisolone treated, same amount of cells. If we treat with cyclosporin, it also protects the cells, but this may be because of the, uh, the uh, prevents the immune effects of, of cyclosporin. And then this is at 14 weeks, these three pictures. If we, if we don't give cyclosporin at all, there's no cell survival at 14 weeks. And by the way, people talk about immune privilege of cells in the spinal cord. I do not believe that the spinal cord injury uh, site is an immune privileged site. I believe all it does is slows down rejection, but rejection will occur. So anyway, methylprednisolone with cyclosporin is the most, uh, preserves the most number of cells in the injured spinal cord. And this is just to convince you that this green is real. If we don't transplant anything, you don't see any green. This is what happens when you inject olfactory and sheathing glial cells into the surrounding spinal cord. We discovered that if you inject cells right into the middle of the injury site, you end up with a island of cells at the injury site, not touching the surrounding spinal cord. And this is not good. So instead, what we developed is a method where we always inject the cells into the surrounding spinal cord, and the cells were injected here. At one week, you can see the cells are migrating into the injury site, and at four weeks, they're producing a, a nice, contiguous bridge right across the injury site. These are olfactory and cheating glial cells, by the way. They, they like to migrate. Um, my, my student, uh, Kai Liu, um, one day he came into the, uh, my office and he said, Wise, wise, what are these? They look like upside down flying seagulls. Well, these are myelin segments. Uh, these are, of course, olfactory and sheathing glial cells because they're green. This is the nucleus. And you see it's hollow inside here. And um, when you stain with neurofilm, you can see that there's an axon inside the myelin segment. And this is a node of Ranvier. So just to convince you that this is for real, when we t section the spinal cord and we look, um, if you just orient your eyes, I know this is a very complicated picture, we had stained the paranodal uh, myelin uh, protein, a uh, paranodal protein called Casper, and that's in red. The neurofilament is in blue, and the GFP is, of course, the olfactory and sheathing glial cells. And you see there's an axon here that's been myelinated completely by, by um, olfactory and sheathing glial cells. Here's one segment. You see the two, the two cat's eyes here of the node of Ranvier. And then here's another segment, the cat's eye, and here's the third segment. This is three consecutive olfactory and sheathing glial cell myelinated segment of one axon. And in fact, if you look here, I, I think I showed the picture here. Uh, let me see, right here. You can see that here's a olfactory and sheathing glial cell myelinated axon with one that was not myelinated by olfactory and sheathing glial cells, probably by oligodental glial cells. And you can see that the node of Ranvier looks normal. Here's another one. This is uh, myelinated by olfactory and sheathing glial cells, and these are uh, non-olfactory and sheathing glial cell myelinated axons. So based on that, we said, wow, this is very interesting. This means that the olfactory the oligo, I'm sorry, the olfactory and sheathing glial cells are replacing oligodendral glial segments in the spinal cord. And we, so we decided to stain for the uh, oligodendral glial cell segments. That's stained by RIP, and that's red. And so this is the first picture of its kind that I know. Here is an olfactory and sheathing glial cells that's myelinating this axon, and it is the other side of the node of Ranvier 
is myelinated by an oligodendroglial cell and looks like a normal uh, myelin segment. And by the way, when we counter stain with, um, with the Herx stain, which stains nuclei, we find that there's only, for every time, there's only one nucleus here. And, and um, um, <clears throat> it's, it myelinates the, the axons just like Schwann cells would. Um, the olfactory and sheathing glial cells have two forms. One of them is that they have these long processes that sometimes extend for many millimeters. And you can see these in the spinal cord. And it's really quite interesting that every time you see one of these, these you see many, many axons. The red is neurofilament stain that seems to be associated with these long um, processes. So, you know, wouldn't it be nice indeed if we could transplant olfactory and sheathing glial cells into the spinal cord? And so one of my former postdocs, uh, Hong Yun Huang, went back to China and he did it. Unfortunately, I don't think we can replicate that anywhere else, even in China today. Um, he has now done over 700 patients with olfactory and sheathing glial cells from aborted uh, um, fetuses. And <clears throat> um, when we first started thinking about a cell source for spinal cord injury, we looked into the possibility of uh, using aborted fetuses, and it turns out that there are not enough aborted fetuses in all of China to, to give us 400 patients worth of cells to, to do a clinical trial. So uh, we could not actually go ahead and test this. Um, so while olfactory and sheathing glial cells are attractive candidates for transplantation, there's no good source of the cells. Adult olfactory and sheathing glial cells are difficult to isolate. Uh, Jeffrey Reisman has now been, been trying for four years to do this and still has not succeeded. Uh, that is taking olfactory and sheathing glial cells from the nose and growing them to transplant into the sp uh, spinal cord. Also, the one single decision for me was an uh, important deciding point was that fetal olfactory and sheathing glial cells are not immune matched to the host and they're, they're not readily available. I believe these cells are rejected from the spinal cord within six weeks after transplantation. So bone marrow autografts are a possible source of immune-compatible cells, but several clinical trials in Incheon, in Tsingzhou, also in Prague, suggested limited benefits of bone marrow stem cells. I know and I hope that Osamu Homo will tell us much more about bone marrow stem cells in, in the coming um, weeks, but when, I mean, coming day, but I could not um, justify the use of bone marrow stem cells in our clinical trials, and so we began to consider umbilical cord blood uh, cells. They're widely available, they're HLA matchable, and they're beneficial in animal models of spinal cord injury. So umbilical cord blood mononuclear cells have been reported by many investigators to improve recovery in animals after spinal cord injury. The first report was by Supporta um, in, in University of Tampa, of Florida in Tampa, 2004. Um, there have been a number of reports that it protects contused spinal cords. In 2004, uh, in Tianjin, Li and Zhang reported that it improves locomotor recovery in hemisected rats. Uh, Ku et al. at Yonsei University reported that it improves uh, contused rat spinal cord uh, combining uh, when the treatment is combined with brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And finally, Dasari in 2008 reported that it improves walking in contused spinal cords. The mechanisms are not well understood as to why these cells are beneficial. Uh, Dasari has reported that it improves remyelination. It reduces apoptosis, it increases metalloproteases, and it reduces tissue plasminogen activators. Um, a number of groups, including Nishio at Chiba University, reported that these cells survive longer than three weeks at injury, and these are human umbilical cord blood cells, survive three to four weeks at, um, in contused rat spinal cords, and reduces acute tissue damage, and Kao showed that it increases VEG, uh, which is vascular endothelial growth factors in contused rat spinal cords. So many independent laboratories have reported um, um, improvements in animals and suggested some mechanisms by which it could occur. We took rat mononuclear cells from, rat, uh, from young neonatal rats and we transplanted them into the spinal cord. And I was quite pleased by two things that we observed. The first is that 
these cells don't migrate. This is at two weeks after transplantation into uninjured spinal cord. Like good children, they, once you transplant them, they stay where they're put. I don't like children that wander everywhere. You don't know where they are getting into, and they can become a danger to themselves and to the spinal cord. Well, so in summary, a little core blood cells, which uh, no uh, mononuclear cells, which include monocytes, lymphocytes, and stem cells, CD34 and CD133, but no neutrophils or red cells, are beneficial in spinal cord injury. Uh, many laboratories, independent laboratories, have reported this. The cells usually survive three to four weeks before immune rejection. They do not migrate, they do not produce neurons in the spinal cord, and they do not elicit gliosis in the spinal cord. This is very important because I really wanted to get a cell type that does not cause a, a immune reaction or gliosis in the spinal cord. Now, in 2004, my colleagues in Hong Kong University reported that lithium um, <clears throat> stimulates regeneration in the spinal cord. This is published in the Journal of Neurotrauma in November of 2004. And I said to my, and I was at that time beginning a distinguished uh, professorship, visiting professorship at Hong Kong University, and I said, lithium, lithium is used for manic depression. Why would it have this effect on spinal cord? Well. Um, as I will show, there's a, a huge, huge literature of lithium effects on neural stem cells and on growth factors. In 2004, Wu Tian Wu, who's the senior investigator in, in this group, reported that lithium enhances proliferation and neuronal differentiation of neuroprogenitor cells. By the way, lithium has long been known to support proliferation of stem cells, and if you take a look at, and Stephen Stice might be interested in this. If you take a look at the Wisconsin medium for growing um, embryonic stem cells, you find that it has one millimolar lithium in it. And that was determined purely on an empirical basis. So in 2008, in the Journal of Neuroscience, Dill et al. reported that lithium uh, promotes axonal growth and recovery in injured spinal cords. So we came back and I had a group of undergraduate students in the lab and I said, please put some lithium onto these neonatal rat spinal cord uh, mononuclear cells and, and they did and they said, oh my gosh, look at this. When they put in lithium in the culture and they, they tried many doses, it turns out the best in the spinal cord was three, and the in vitro was three millimole. It was over three times the amount of, of uh, cells in the spinal cord after seven days compared to controls. It is a very robust, uh, stimulator of axonal growth, uh, of, of uh, cell proliferation. And when we injected the cells into the spinal cord surrounding the injury site, this is the injury site, when we treat it with lithium, you can see there's many, many more cells than compared to when we treat the animals with saline, but they were injected with the same amount of, of uh, cells. Here's a section of the same spinal cords, and you can see that the cells have migrated from from these two surrounding areas right into the injury site and producing a bridge across the injury site. And we actually measured the amount of green fluorescent protein RNA that is expressed in the spinal cord. And there's over a thousand times the GFP in the spinal cord of the lithium-treated animals. But even more significantly, when we looked at the, the messenger RNA for neurotrophins, um, in the lithium-treated animals, which are the blue, there's much, much more LIF, NT3, GDNF, and NGF in the spinal cord. And by the way, NT3, GDNF, and NGF are the three neurotrophins that are known to stimulate regeneration in the spinal cord. And it's been reported by more than a dozen laboratories to do that. So how does lithium act? Lithium acts by inhibiting a number of phosphatases and activating a number of well-known phosphokinases, all of which converge on a single enzyme that's called glycogen synthetase kinase 3 beta, GSK3 beta. This enzyme normally inhibits glycogen synthetase, which is an important uh, um, enzyme for storing energy. But even more important, this, this enzyme inhibits by phosphorylating nuclear factors and two of the most important nuclear factors are WNT beta catenin and nuclear factor of activated in, uh, T cells, NFAT. 
These nuclear factors control many uh, families of genes that are responsible for growth, protection, inflammation, and differentiation in the spinal cord and in the brain, in all tissues. And in fact, almost all the effects of lithium can be attributed to this effect. We have recently found that, that uh, the nuclear factors must be uh, dephosphorylated by uh, calcineurin before they can act. So if you put in um, uh, cyclosporin or, or FK506, you can completely block the effects of lithium on growth and, and proliferation. So in summary, lithium has been used for 50 years to treat manic depression, but, and it's been long known to stimulate bone marrow and neural stem cells to produce granulocytes and neurons. It acts by stimulating umbilical cord blood cells to proliferate and to produce uh, neurotrophins. It does so by inhibiting GSK3 beta, turning on WNT beta catenin and NFAT, which would stimulate umbilical cord blood and neural stem cells to grow, to differentiate neurons and to produce neurotrophins. So, in 2005, um, uh, we, uh, Kwa Fai So and I at the University of Hong Kong, uh, developed and organized the China Spinal Cord Injury Network. This network currently has 24 centers in it, and it's in many cities in China, and it is also in Taiwan. Suchi is one of our centers. In the early days, we visited many of the centers, and, and this is a group of uh, um, uh, doctors, uh, this some of you may recognize this is Chu Kong, he's one, one of the most prominent neuroscientists in China. Uh, this is John Liang, who's, uh, who's currently, uh, he was the head of the orthopedic department at Hong Kong University when I first came. This is uh, Dong Pu Fong, who's the, the uh, son of Dong Xiaoping, and he in 1973 was thrown out of a third story window by Red Guard and he broke his back and he uh, controls all the rehabilitation funding and research in China. This was our first uh, uh, principal investigator meeting in Hong Kong. And we have the China Spinal Cord Injury Network. Uh, where we are uh, running the following trials, an observational trial, a phase one oral lithium trial, a phase two oral lithium trial in China. Um, we're currently running a phase two trial, and, and this is what um, uh, Wai San Poon will talk about. And then finally, as soon as this is completed, we're planning a phase three trial looking at 400 subjects with, that will receive umbilical cord blood cell transplants and randomized to lithium or placebo and follow for one year. I'm, I'm running out of time, but I'm going to show you a uh, few slides about how we decided how the cells will be injected into the spinal cord. Um, uh, we realize that when you inject cells into the spinal cord, the volume uh, is related to the dimensions, so that if you inject 40 microliters of cells, the dimensions of the, of the bolus of cells that you've injected will be over 4 millimeters. And this seems to be quite a lot. So if you look at it in, in relative to the human spinal cord, the red is what a 40 microliter injection would occupy. That's the volume it would occupy in the spinal cord. So we were very concerned that this is too much for the spinal cord. And by the way, 35 to 50 microliters is what the average Chinese injection is in, 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 in uh, China. And so we decided to, and we, we held a, a consensus conference in 2007, and, and we decided to uh, develop the following methods of injecting. We're going to inject at a 45 degree angle into the dorsal root entry zone above and below the spinal cord. Uh, the, um, the, I, I made this slide only for, for rats. It's one millimeter deep. And then uh, we're injecting different amounts into the spinal cord. And so in the rats, this is what it looks like. We just put dye in and we inject it. So the needles went in here and the, and the dye was injected into this area. And whether you put the bevel, the needle down, and the bevel up, there's some difference in the way the dye is distributed. So we are also using floating needle injections, but I'm going to let uh, Wai San Poon describe this to you. Um, all these uh, phase two studies are to lead to this last trial, which is um, uh, so we call CN103, where we're planning to, to uh, compare um, uh, umbilical cord blood alone against umbilical cord blood plus lithium on motor and sensory scores. And these are all in chronic spinal cord injury, Asia A, B, and C. And uh, there are three possible outcomes in such a study. Uh, and one is that neither treatment group uh, shows improvement in function. And in that case, we would recommend against both treatments, right? If 
both treatment groups show function, then we would have to do a surgically controlled trial to rule out placebo and surgery alone effects. And finally, um, if core blood plus lithium is better than core blood alone, this would be a strong uh, evidence for us to recommend core blood plus lithium since this is a truly double-blind randomized trial. Um, two years ago, my colleagues at the Kunming Army General Hospital, and particularly Zhu Fei um, and, and her team, came to me and showed me the data of 30 subjects with complete spinal cord injuries who had surgery at 2 to 65 days after injury. They stabilized the spinal cord, they did a laminectomy, and then, and then they cut into the spinal cord using a lateral myelotomy. And they removed the necrotic tissue from the middle of the spinal cord. And remarkably, at three months after intensive locomotor training, even though all these patients were age A, 43% walked with a crutch or cane without assistance. 17 walked without any kind of crutch or cane, and 47% converted from Asia A to D, uh, B or C or D. And so um, it's a very straightforward study. At 17 days after surgery, the patients were evaluated, they fitted with a corset, ankle support for drops. They started a very intensive uh, walking program, which I call the 666 program. It's six hours a day, six days a week, and six months. And they evaluated the patients at one, two, and three months. And they scored the patients on the so-called Kunming locomotor score. And the patients are put onto, onto a, a walker. Uh, initially, uh, the, the, the nurses or a family member would hold the leg so that they could stand, and eventually they can stand on their own. Then they have uh, ropes that, that would hold and lock the knees as the patients are walking. And they progress through these various stages. Nearly half of the patients would end up in, in this, uh, these categories within three months after injury. This has never been heard of um, before. This is a picture of what happens in their hospital. You can see many patients walking around. This is uh, some of the data. I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I just want to suggest to you that sensory improvement, and these are PIN scores, improved greatly uh, over, rapidly over time, and then uh, motor scores improve over the three months. Um, so in summary, that intradural study showed that all patients that were age A before surgery um, uh, recover substantially, and half of the patients recover ability to walk without assistance. By the way, uh, it seems that this walking uh, has very beneficial effects on urinary tract infection and decubiti because not a single patient in the whole study had a urinary tract infection or decubitus during the study. So in follow-up, Dr. Uh, Ju Fei and, and her colleagues have now carried out intradural decompressions in over 700 patients with subacute spinal cord injury, and they've seen similar results. We're now currently planning a multi-center phase three trial to, to compare laminectomy alone against laminectomy and intradural decompression. This procedure provides an unprecedented opportunity to do a surgically controlled trial of cell transplants in subacute spinal cord injury. Because if you have the spinal cord that's open, you can put the cells in and you can compare it against patients that have no cells in. This is a surgically controlled trial. Um, I just want to very briefly tell you about the results of the most recent uh, phase two lithium trial that we did. 40 subjects randomized to six weeks of oral placebo or lithium, titrated to 0.6 to one millimolar of saline. We, uh, the identity of the treatment was masked and the patients received lithium titration values from a previous trial. We used dummy lithium values for the titration of the placebo patients. And all the patients are Asia A, and they were evaluated six weeks and six months. Um, uh, there was no significant difference in the, in, between the two groups in ter terms of motor, uh, sensory and motor scores. But to our astonishment, we found a remarkable difference in visual analog scale, which represents neuropathic pain in the patients. Um, on average, the, the patients who were controls showed no change in neuropathic or uh, visual analog scales uh, at six weeks or at six months, but those patients that are treated with lithium showed a 25-point drop in, in uh, visual analog scales. And what even surprised us more was that this 
reduction in visual analog scales was maintained at six weeks, I mean at six months. Uh, remember, the drug was only given for six weeks, and then the, um, we uh, analyzed them at six weeks and six months. And so here's the, the results on the individual patients in the control group. I sorted them out. Uh, these are all the patients. Um, the patients who had scores of 50 or greater had severe neuropathic pain. And you can see that all of them showed more or less increases or stayed the same during the six weeks. One patient showed a drop between six weeks and six months. We don't know what that's from. But in any case, this is the control group. Uh, there were some increases and there was one drop, but they stayed mostly the same. This is the pictures of the um, lithium treated group. You can see this one dropped, this one dropped, this one dropped and then came back up, this one dropped to zero and then came back up. And, and almost all the patients that had uh, uh, visual analog scales of uh, scores of greater than 50 showed substantial drops of, of, um, of um, uh, uh, scores uh, at six weeks and at six months. Um, this is, these are some of the people, uh, we, John DiTuno helped us a great deal in training the, the uh, spinal cord injury centers uh, to do the neurological examinations. This is Li Chan Jun at, at the CRRC. Uh, this is uh, Suzanne Kuhn, by the way, who heads the Hong Kong Spinal Cord Injury Fund that supports our clinical trials. Um, I want to just briefly say that we have, we were asked by many Americans when they heard that there, we had, were doing trials in China to whether they could fly to Hong Kong, Hong Kong or China to do the trials. And so uh, we went on ahead and, and started a series of uh, discussions with centers and eight centers have now joined the SCI Net USA and uh, Brackenridge Hospital will probably be the site of our first US trials. Um, we have proposed four trials in the U.S. Uh, these are phase two and then phase three trials. And so in summary, uh, in conclusion, umbilical cord blood and uh, mononuclear cells and lithium are beneficial in animal spinal cord injury models. We've shown that lithium strongly stimulates umbilical cord blood to proliferate and produce neurotrophins both in vitro and in vivo. Lithium also stimulates neural stem cells to produce neurons, including resulting in more gray matter in brains, and this has been shown recently in humans. And we're now testing lithium and umbilical cord blood mononuclear cell treatment of human chronic spinal cord injury in China and the USA. Thank you.